Mr. Long, you are good to go. All right, thank you. Um, so I'd like to call the November 15th, 2021 Citrus School Committee meeting to order. Uh, this meeting will be recorded and posted following the meeting. Public comment will be available through Zoom and communi community members can email me at mlong at sit.org uh, with any questions after the meeting. Um, so I'm gonna do a roll call vote to um, start the meeting. Uh, Lindblom? Yes. Gates? Yes. Uh, Long, yes. Uh, Prokowski? Yes. And Brandolini? Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, so the first item on our agenda is celebrating student success with uh, Principal Reardon at um, Wampatuck. And Ms. Reardon, you should be able to unmute yourself. There you go. I did. I just thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to share my screen. Can I do that as well? Yeah, you most certainly can. If you're sharing audio before you share, make sure you click that bottom left-hand corner that says share audio, computer audio too. Okay, wait, you're gonna have to help me with that again. Cause I, I do have um, sure. two videos in the slideshow that right, I let's, wanna- Let's, yep, you go ahead and share before you actually click the share button. You want, do you look in that bottom left-hand corner? That'll say something like share computer audio too. Do you see that? I say share screen. Click the share screen button, the green button. You click the little arrow up. Nope, I just want you to click that green arrow first. Okay, okay. Now look and then the share sound. There you go. Okay. And then I'm going to share. And this. Now, you're gonna, now you're going to share. You got it. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, hang on one second. I'm going to move my things out of the way. Okay. Oh, it's coming. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Let me get back to the first one. Okay. All right. I think I'm all set. Thank you. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, Tracy Reardon, I'm the principal at Wampatuck, and I'm going to be um, sharing our celebration of learning tonight. So um, I always like to tie everything we do back to our mission statement, because ultimately everything that we do at Wampatuck is a stepping stone towards the Situate Public Schools mission statement. So tonight, um, we are celebrating and highlighting a small piece of what we do every day to grow our youngest learners into well-rounded global citizens. So we also have, um, we'll also connect our learning to the two pillars that Superintendent Burkhead has set forth for our goals for this year. And our celebration tonight does fall under both of these pillars. Wampatuck is a community working together to develop and maintain a dynamic student-centered learning environment. And we're also committed to do what it takes to prepare our students to be competitive, to be competitive in the 21st century global environment. So we're, uh, we are definitely a community of readers at Wampatuck. And I think we all know and understand the importance of reading and literacy and that it is um, a fundamental component of learning. Um, we also all know that having a solid foundation in early reading skills is crucial to children's future reading performance and in becoming strong independent readers. Um, and we know that literacy is the foundation for all learning. If a child can't read, they can't learn. And in order for a child to advance through subjects like math and science and social studies, they must be able to read and understand what the content is. But one of the things we don't always think about when we talk about um, literacy and reading is that reading also makes us empathetic people. And early exposure to rich literacy experiences helps children understand the world and the people around them. Research has shown us that the types of books that we read influence how we relate to others and that reading fiction stories helps us understand what others are thinking and feeling. We want our children to become more empathetic people because that helps to create peaceful environments and allows us to understand other people's experiences, thoughts, feelings, and, and it encourages a kind and accepting personality. So we're gonna celebrate the great reading that's going on at Wampatuck 
um, and we're going to um, share with you um, a building wide and school wide um, celebration that we had um, was supposed to be um, the Friday before um, Halloween, but we had to push it off because of the storm. So I'm going to just introduce um, Shannon Tobin. She's going to unmute as well, and she's just going to talk to you a little bit about Foundations, which is a new um, piece of our reading program that all K-2 students are participating in. Ms. Tobin, you should be able to unmute yourself. Oh, oh there we go. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so while there are many, many components to reading the Foundations Phonics program that our district has just purchased for all four elementary schools, is an integral building block that's extremely important for our K-2 students. Um, and if you want to jump down to the next slide, I can talk a little bit about how it works. Um, so a typical lesson, though this picture here is Wampatuck, um, it's very indicative of what you would see at any four of our elementary schools in regard to the structure. Um, we'll follow a series of whole class activities. Um, in the second grade, we begin a daily lesson with letter sound symbol identification, which in the middle picture is what that first grader is also doing. Um, we review sounds orally, targeted letters, patterns already learned, such as vowels, um, newer or challenging sounds, targeted consonants, vowel teams. Um, and then we introduce the skill of the unit. Um, this week, for example, in second grade, we're working on suffixes, which is S and ES. Um, and we build words together by tapping out the sounds, which in that third picture, um, you'll see a, a child tapping out letters going sound by sound. Um, and then writing them in second grade, we write them on whiteboards. Um, the next part of a lesson might also include what the program calls trick words, which is a word that has a spelling pattern that may not always follow the most common rule. Um, or we may introduce a word of the day, which is more of a vocabulary word um, that we discuss. And as many words have multiple meanings and we'll often end the lesson by building either of those words um, and some of our spelling words into a sentence together, which they write um, and then we read and reread fluently. Um, and that's typically how we would end a lesson. Thank you, Shannon. So again, like Shannon said, Foundations um, is a piece of a reading of our reading program that was purchased this year that all four elementary schools are using in their K to two classrooms. Um, and it is um, teaching children the building blocks of um, reading. So as part of a building-wide celebration, um, we are all strong, a strong community of readers. And as a way to celebrate, we had a school-wide event where we invited students and staff to dress up as a book character. This is the perfect way of um, students being able to put themselves in um, the shoes of another person and to take on um, a character in a book. Um, the whole school celebrated by um, dressing up, engaging in conversations about books, characters, and stories throughout the day. So this right here is a picture of Mrs. Green's first graders dressed as their characters, in, including Mrs. Green. So each grade level went about it a little bit differently. This is um, a fourth grade class. Fourth, grader, fourth grade um, teachers and students, they decided to um, take on the books, the Who Was books, which are um, mostly biographies um, about um, famous people and students dressed as a character and then they completed a template filling out information about those characters. So they did some research on those people and then they presented. And then they were also invited to dress as that character if they'd like. So this is um, Mrs. Horn's fourth grade class sharing facts about their characters. The third grade, um, the, all the third grade teachers dressed as I survived books. So this is Mrs. Spinelli's class. Um, she dressed as I survived a shark attack. Um, and then um, third grade students were invited to dress as characters. And they um, um, stood in front of their class if they wanted to, and they would share clues about their characters and students tried to guess which character in which book they were portraying. Okay. 
These are some first graders. So first graders were able to share um, during a whole group um, exercise where kids were sitting on the carpet and then students that wanted to were able to sit in the teacher chair and they shared their book and the character that they were dressed as and they talked about why they chose that character, um, how they connected to that character um, and what some of their favorite parts were about the book. Um, these are some second graders and some first graders. Um, not all students are comfortable dressing up, um, which is fine. And um, some students found some very clever ways um, to, to get around that. So here's an example of a, a boy who brought in the book, my book about me, and he dressed as himself, um, which I thought was just a, a great way to be able to participate um, and somebody who maybe isn't comfortable dressing up. Um, and then you can see some second graders here. Um, again, you know, it doesn't take a lot to dress as a character. Um, I love the way um, this one student has the book Diary of the Wimpy Camp Kid and then made just a mask on a, on a ruler to portray that character. Um, here are some more examples. Again, students that are just clever ways to portray characters and having opportunities to talk about why they picked those characters how they connected with them and what makes them special. Some more examples of some kindergartners and some um, fifth graders. Um, these are third graders. Um, you can see some kids brought in props, which makes the costumes even better. They're um, getting into the poster. So it wasn't just the students who enjoyed the day, even the office staff got into um, the celebration. So we all dressed as click, clack, moo, cows that type. Um, and then um, we also decorated the office um, with some of the signs um, from that book. I don't know if you all know that book. If you haven't read that book, you absolutely need to go and read it. Um, it's a great one. And I don't know if you can see the sign behind us there. It says close, no milk and no eggs because the cows were on strike because it's cold in the barn and they wanted electric blankets. So then we also had other staff dress up. So the first grade team, they all dressed as characters from Kevin Hanks books. So not just celebrating books and characters, but also celebrating authors. Um, the kindergarten team dressed as all the characters from The Very Hungry Caterpillar. Um, Mrs. Burns, our speech therapist, she was um, Charlotte from Charlotte's Web. And then we had a classic here of Little Red Riding Hood and The Big Bad Wolf. It's interesting. Um, we found a lot of kids really didn't know that story. So sometimes we forget that kids aren't need to be exposed to classics as well. Um, so this is Mrs. Flannery and Mrs. Edgren is the big bad wolf. Um, and then Mrs. Sousa is Charlotte from Charlotte's Web and Mrs. Green was Clementine from, excuse me, Chrysanthemum from a Kevin Hanks book. So I do have a video, two videos here of students sharing um, why they chose the characters they did. Um, and um, what makes it important to them. I chose my character Marie Antoinette because she was the queen of France and, I'm, and I've always wanted to actually be a queen and also because she actually, the reason she actually got her head chopped off was for spending money and I love spending money. And also she had an adorable pug named Mops and right now my pom pom, my Pomeranian is subbing in for mom since they don't have a stuffed pose. Just great right there, right? Okay, and one more. I chose Oops, my sorry. character Marie Antoinette because she was the queen of. Okay, hang on. I gotta go to my next slide. Okay. Uh, I chose Hadley because she's a. Um, she's super brave and her story's really inspiring. Um, and it's a really great book and really great descriptions with, um, and she's just a really inspiring character. Um, <laughs> so these are great examples of what we want kids to do, right? We want kids to be to love reading, we want them to be strong, independent readers. We want them to have the building blocks they need to be strong, independent readers. 
Um, and we want them to become more empathetic by, by connecting with characters. I love the way um, Rowan talks about how inspiring the character is to her. And um, hopefully that's gonna lead to her um, growing up to be a strong, independent, empathetic um, adult. Oh, sorry, I keep doing that. Hadley because she's a... Okay, and that's the end of our celebration of learning. Any questions? I can unshare. I thought that was a great presentation to be able to see how the kids, you know, are taking the books that they're using and then, you know, making it come alive as be part of the lesson. So it's it's great to see, um, you know, get that response from the kids as they're you know, either through the pictures or through the videos that you showed at the end. So thank you for sharing that. Um, are there any questions or comments from the the rest of the committee? I just had one. Um, so obviously we're only you know, two months into the school year, but have you seen, has this been an improvement from some of the programs you've used in the past um, from a reading perspective or is it still too early to tell? So we're, we're super excited to have a consistent program. So our, obviously our K-2 teachers have always taught phonics and always taught the building blocks for reading and literacy. But what's important is to have um, a consistent program that every student in Situate is participating in. So all our students, K-2, are, are um, having the same experience. And that's what I think was really important about um, adopting and bringing in foundations. Um, so that's been great. And I, I'm excited to see as, as kids go, um, how they um, grow as readers in, in those um, fundamental learning skills. Okay, great. Well, thank you for sharing the presentation, uh, both you and Mrs. Tobin. You're welcome. Uh, so next on the agenda, we have the Student Advisors Report with uh, Celia Reese and Johnny Kinsley. Hi. All right, we have a quick report tonight. Um, starting with the first quarter of the year ended. It's always a busy time for students, um, but the climate in the school is good this week because it's the last week before the beginning of the holiday breaks and that, that, that time of the year is always great. Um, second, the National Honor Society students have been helping underclassmen in and in after school extra help programs like Lift and Ace. And Stucco is planning their annual pep rally for the early release Wednesday before Thanksgiving break. That day is always a really great moment for community building. Sorry. And oh, thank you. And uh, seniors now have some of their old senior privileges reinstated, which makes everyone happier. Uh, that includes the opening of the senior calf, which is really exciting. Uh, boys and girls soccer had their had their playoff uh, runs uh, come to an end this past week, unfortunately. Uh, however, the football team won their game against Ashland, uh, twenty-one to fourteen, on Friday night. Uh, their next game will be Saturday in Brockton against Grafton. Uh, winter sports information night is tonight as we prepare for the winter season and that's all we have tonight thank you so much okay thank you uh, are there any questions from the other members of the committee all right well thank you both for representing uh, and next on the agenda we have a presentation with the uh, metro program so I'll turn it over to uh miss michelle crawford Hi everyone, Michelle Crawford, uh, Situate Metco Director. Um, I'm just sharing our year in review and um, I'll be open to answer any questions that you have. One second, share screen. One second, I'm, I don't know what's going on here. One second, I have to do my system. Oh. No problem, take it up. Here we go. So, Situate Medco program is in its 53rd year. 
Um, the program has grown from 19 students back in 1968 and just attending high school to 61 students across the district um, at all of the schools. I just wanted to show what demographics look like where students came from in Boston and the, the, these demographics in Boston in general and what it looks like here in Situate. And this is what it looks like in the state of Massachusetts. This is our current enrollment, what it looks like across the district. This has been a big shift this year with more students at Gates than at the high school. And this is our enrollment timeline. So pretty soon I would be doing requests for siblings. Um, I give sibling preference uh, to families. I, in late January, I would do a request from headquarters um, for enrollment numbers for people. And what I would do is I would ask the district what available seats we have open, and then I will reach out to headquarters to get applicants. Um, it takes a couple of months to get applicants. Uh, enrollment is down statewide, um, and it's been harder to get applicants um, in, in Medco in general. Um, the hope is, is to have all families in um, by the end of May, families who are coming into our district by the end of May so that they can take part in whatever new family orientation, et cetera, that the district might be offering. Um, those families will be invited to our end of year celebration um, and they'll be assigned a new family mentor. Um, and in November, and we're starting this this year again, we're revamping our family partnership program. So it'll be a matching and I'll talk more about that later. Here are some of the program goals that we have. Um, so we complete, we, last week, we secured late busing for our secondary students. It will be a six o'clock late bus um, so they can participate in after school and out of school time activities. It, it has to be a school sponsored event. It's something that uh, they sign up for daily um, and parents sign on to. Um, we're working on revitalizing our family partnership program with community stakeholders. So the Situate Friends of Metco is actually working on this with me so that we can do uh, family matching. I'm meeting with students now asking who their, who their friends are, who, who do they like to hang out with, what do they like to do, and completing a form. I'll be reaching out to parents to see who kids are talking about at home, um, who their friends are at school and then reaching out to teachers just to see if there are any commonalities so we can make matches. Um, there's gonna be a training for participants around um, race and racism, um, which is going to be done by We The People and we secured a grant from the SEF for that. Also ongoing is the support in creation and ma maintenance of a Situate Medco parent group. Um, when COVID hit, our, our parent group had hit a nice stride and then COVID hit and it, it took a big hit. Um, so I, I'm in conversations with families now to revitalize that group because it's really important for parents to feel a sense of belonging and engagement um, and in the creation of that group will help in that. Um, right now, I this, this Friday, this Thursday and Friday, oh, Thursday, Friday and Saturday, students will be attending an HBCU college fair in Brookline that Brookline Metco is hosting um, and doing on the spot admissions. So the goal is to have at least 90% of our seniors um, si apply to at least one HBCU and attend this college fair on, um, on Thursday evening and then do on the spot admissions um, Friday into the weekend. So they're getting their emails with appointments and it's all the buzz right now. Some things that I want to work on. Um, by 2023, I would like to see 50% of our Boston resident high school students take at least one honors or advanced placement course. In order for that to become a reality, I think there, there needs to be a piece around caregiver information about the value of honors and advanced placement courses starting in middle school so that that parents and students are hearing about this ahead of time because I think that's part of the issue that we're that that we're having with low enrollment um, 
in those courses. There's also um, a want to have students do this in cohorts so they have support of um, their peers. Um, I also would like to secure um, accessible cultural proficient counselors or social workers who specialize in working with diverse populations who attend primarily white institutions to start in school year 2022-23. Um, in the interim, I'm hoping to work with the counselor and social worker at MECO headquarters to run specific groups with students and around support. Um, we lost our social worker, um, so they're in the process of hiring a new social worker. So I have lots for that person to do when they, when they get hired. I also want to create a model for after school supervision and tutoring to officially launch next school year. The last thing, not the last thing, but the last thing on this list is um, by 2020, to 23 to have 50% of our Boston resident high school students participate in at least one college dual enrollment class. Um, I'm working on a partnership with Medco headquarters and Boston area colleges to create a Medco cohort. Um, so we're just in the beginning conversations of that. So I didn't even put on going because it's just a beginning conversation. I think I skipped some, okay. So a couple of student accomplishments. Um, I only have two to share tonight, um, and this is in the last couple of weeks. Um, Delina Geber Hewitt, one of our 12th graders, is a, a posse semifinalist. She's decided not to go forward with it, but just being a semifinalist is a big to do. Um, Arlie Switzen, also a 12th grader, she qualified for the College Board National Recognition Program Award, um, and we're working with her to do those applications soon. I have a video of the last year in review. This is the second video of the last couple of days. My other computer crashed and that's a whole other story. So this doesn't have music and all of the bells and whistles that I wanted to have on it. This year, last year, we secured a Metco space and we started in the process of, of making it ours. Um, we're at the high school um, room 101A. We also invested a lot of time into um, creating a mural um, by student artist Sydney Marshall. Um, There's a lot of weekend hours um, coming in on Saturdays working on this. It's still not quite done because it's her senior year this year and there's still a lot to be done. We also furnished the room with some of the MECO grant. Um, as you can see in that um, last photo there. I'm going into student meetings. We, we do um, a Mr. number Michelle, of meetings. I'm sorry, you're, you're still showing just your uh, slide. You're not showing any pictures. Oh no, sorry. New share, I am so sorry. Why is this not showing? One sec, I'm sorry. Take it up, no problem. I'm gonna try again. Pause. There it is. I'm so sorry about that. So this this year, we not this year, last year into this year, we um, furnished the new space at the high school, room 101A um, near the library. Um, put a mural on the wall. Um, this was designed and painted by Sydney Marshall, who's a 12th grade art student here at the high school. She used this as, as part of her portfolio for AP art. We also um, furnished the room and it's a little bit messy today. So I'm sorry, that's what it looks like today after everyone's gone. I didn't get a chance to get it neatened up. We do a number of student groups throughout the year from book groups with, young, with um, middle grade students. Um, a lot of our groups are around just students connecting and seeing themselves 
um, and being able to talk about their experiences. Um, so these are some pictures of some of our groups, usually centered around lunchtime. Something big that we worked on this year was the Harvard's Ride, Harvard Rides equity, equity Improvement Cycle. We're about halfway through an equity improvement cycle. Um, and what it was is that we had a number of stakeholders come together and we started working on a personal and equity um, team culture. Um, and we have an initiative that we, we want to get going and we're, we're still in the the implementation phase of that, um, because there's some training that needs to be done ahead of time. Um, our district team members were from senior leadership, um, and mostly from senior senior leadership and um, building leadership. Um, these were our student, oh my goodness, this is moving too quickly. I wanted to show you our student. Um, pause. These are our student members of that group. Um, these are all C I, why is this moving on like this? Our student members of that team, um, all seniors this year, Michael Gant, Arlise Woodson, Delina Geber-Hewitt, and Dakari Rodriguez. Um, I can't even put into words all of the work that they put into ensuring that their voices were elevated in this group and in sharing their voice with other districts. There were five other districts. It was actually five districts in total to include Marblehead, Swampscott, uh, Weston, um, and, and Cohasset. And they, they were powerful student leaders throughout this process with um, the Harvard Rights Program. We spent a lot of time with our seniors in the last year. Um, so here's a few pictures of our, these are moving way too quickly. Um, the last year's seniors um, went off to Northeastern University, Wentworth University of Technology, um, University of Massachusetts, Boston, Hampton University, um, and, in, and the University of New England, we had one student get into five HBCUs, um, but decided to take a gap year. We spent time in end of year, on end of year celebrations in Boston. Um, this year we, um, had a car parade and a celebration at the Franklin Park, um, up at the Franklin Park. This was one of our kindergarten graduates. Graduates. some things not photographed and i'm going to pause this we also did uh, many communities many stories where we brought in author jennifer de leon um, with the book don't ask me where i'm from which is a metco story um, and i was so thankful for her for telling that story because it's it's not one that's often heard um, we had some student leaders who worked with her around um, really running that interview that we had with her in that discussion uh, we had student tutoring with, with ACLC tutoring service in Boston. And what they were really doing was filling gaps. Um, because what we, as you know, um, the last couple of years have been really trying years. And um, there are some academic gaps as a result of how learning is experienced now. We had a poetry workshop with Enzo Surin, who this is his second go around visiting with us and working with students. Um, we had a lot of student advocacy work around DEI and J. Um, we had Saturday bus runs into Boston to ensure the students were getting what they needed um, for school. Um, and this was uh, all six schools. Citroen Meco parent group meetings, Citroen Friends of Meco planning meetings, and student participation. We had a lot of student representation in um, interviews for district hires and even those um, 
forms that we have before um, hires come on. I'm going to go back into this. There's some legislative updates that people need to be aware of because it could impact the METCO program. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to put these up here. I'm not going to speak more on it. That's the, it's just something that people need to be aware of that's on the horizon. As you know, an up, upcoming event with the HBCU College Fair at, with Brookline Metco. We also have our annual Metco Directors Association Adult Conference and Youth Conference. We will have four students attending a youth conference. Um, and the theme this year for them is, is NAP, uh, anti working with anti-racism initiatives. Questions, comments? I'll turn it over to the other members of the committee. Are there any uh, questions for Ms. Crawford? Mike, I have uh, a couple of questions. Uh, Michelle, thanks for that. Um, generally, I guess kind of two part question. One is how many students ideally does it, do, you, do you think Situate could realistically host? Maybe that's for Superintendent Burkhead as well. And when do students generally start in the district? So I'll answer the second part of your question first. Um, there, there was no generally start for the Citroen Micro program before I came on board. Um, it is generally an easier transition for a student to start in an earlier grade. Um, it, the, the emotional impact of starting in a higher grade is, is great and it's a high price to pay um, often for, for students coming into a, a district that is not like in not in any way like the one that they're coming from so we are making every effort to have students start in first and second grade um, as far as um, we get a per pupil allocation for Metco um, so right now we are we, we stay within the 60 to 65 ballpark because and how our budget works is that we get an average of the average over three years so I, I need to stay within that ballpark um, if there is needs to be an expansion or if there, there's a one for an expansion, that, that needs to be a request made to DESE um, and or the town saying, this is what we're doing and we're going to take on the cost of it. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Michelle. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I really enjoyed hearing more about the program. I was really curious, you had mentioned in your table around goals and things that were ongoing. You mentioned that this 50, this, this interest in a 50% number for both honors and AP courses and dual enrollment yes. courses. And I was just curious if you knew, um, what's that number now? And um, sort of what do you think is some of the root causes of the number not being where you'd like it to be. I was just really curious. So as far as honors and AP, it's only two um, out of the 16 that I that I know of. Um, and in speaking to students about the why, um, I'm not encouraged to. Um, I, I, I don't want to do it. I don't have the support that I need. And that's the, the, their truth of how they're and what they're sharing. Um, as far as the dual enrollment is concerned, there, there's some barriers to that because of, of, because of distance, because of the time that they get back into Boston, be, because of, of workload, a lot of kids have uh, after school jobs. So the hope would be is to make this as predictable as possible and to make it a cohort so they have support. Um, so that, okay, everybody's doing this on Saturday at headquarters and we're going to hold each other accountable to this. And that's the hope of how that would work. 
Thanks so much. So I'm just, as you think about this idea that they're reporting that they don't feel encouraged and that more support's needed, I guess I'm just wondering, like, I know you had some ideas on that right-hand column. I'm just wondering what those interventions might look like to, to bolster that encouragement and support. I, I think some of this some of this encouragement and support needs to come from home. And I think in educating families about what, the, what their power is in um, advocating for their student um, in, in getting into advanced level courses is, is huge. Um, and that's part of my job to help educate families um, on, on what's available and, and how to navigate getting that. Great, thanks, Michelle. You're welcome. Hi, Michelle. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I have um, a couple of questions. One, I think you kind of answered with a subsequent slide, but um, how, I, you know, I, I, the slide that showed where the kids are placed through the district, mm -hmm. um, how did you choose where they go? I guess I was going to ask where you, how you chose where they, where they go, um, which elementary school, but I guess that depends on the enrollment. It depends on the available seats. And yeah. there's one building where we lost a few families. We lost quite a few families in the past year. So I, I got disenrollments in late August and, and in September. Um, uh, so I, in trying to build a cohort, so Wampatuck, we only have one child at Wampatuck mm -hmm. because we had two students leave. Um, so that, that made it, that, and that's really hard for me to, to sit with, but that's the reality of what happened with, with that particular situation. Um, as far as how enrollment goes, it's based on available seats. So if a school says, I have so many seats in this grade, that's what I'm looking to place. Um, I try not to place kids in older grades because in the last couple of years, that didn't work out well um, mm -hmm. because it, it was really hard. Um, and it was an uphill battle to, the, the social aspect of it and the academic aspect of it, it, it just battling those two things, it was just a lot for students who continue to struggle today. Um, and I don't wanna see that for any child. So that's why we're hoping for the earlier grades. Mm -hmm. And why do you you mentioned also that the overall enrollment in METCO programs throughout the state are down. Is there any discussion of, as to why that might be? Or do you think it's just one of a, a COVID thing too? Like one of the COVID is one thing, but even before COVID this started, um, people have other options closer to home um, and, and they're going for it. I mean, Metco is do, spending a lot of money in advertising right now and, and, and doing outreach, et cetera. It's, it's just people have other options. Mm. Okay, and I wanted to also touch on what um, Carrie was talking about with the AP and the honors classes. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that you know the district could do to encourage you know more more recommendations for Metco students to take part in those classes? I mean, only ha having two students. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, having children in the school system and seeing how it works out, how they end up in the classes they're, they're in. Um, I mean, I would like to see more students overall, you know, take part in more stringent classes, but, you know, the Metco students, especially, if they're not being encouraged to take those classes. I think being purposeful about create building supports and educating students on, on the why, why, mm -hmm. why you should do this, why this is a good thing for you and ensuring that they, they have supports um, and asking them what that, could, that support could look like. So it, engaging their voice and what they need in order to, for this to be success, a successful placement for them. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, th thank you for the presentation. I had a similar question to what Dr. Wachowski and, and Ms. Lindblom had. I mean, just making sure that we, we as a district show that, you know, we're trying to give kids every opportunity they have and, you know, giving them equity students and really any student that wants to take an AP or an honors program, you know, to give them the resources, this is where you go to, to be able to do that. You know, anything we can do, obviously, from the district, we can help with that. 
we want to make sure that we do for uh, for all of our students. Um, and Janice actually covered my question on the the, the impact about the um, the enrollment. I, I remember a couple of years ago before COVID, we had talked about actually doubling our micro numbers. I mean, hopefully, hopefully over the next couple of years, families do want to come back to the program, and you know, they see Situate as a good option for them. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? I just had one more. Sorry, Mike. One follow-up uh, yep. from Michelle. Oh, so I'm just getting back to the the age or the most appropriate age of when our students begin. The, what's the average of those students who are seniors this year? When did they start um, attending Situate, roughly? Between first and third grade. Really? Okay, that's interesting. Okay, what I'd like to do is, um, I'm sure you have it. I don't even know right now, but. I think that maybe some of our goals should be to maintain 100% of our enrollees or 95% of our enrollees through graduation. I'm not sure what our numbers look like. Obviously, as you said, there are challenges here, but maybe we should have some goal about uh, making sure that we can um, offer the services and, and provide um, the right atmosphere and environment for, for our Metco students. I mean, sometimes the moves aren't because that they, they're just not choosing Situate anymore. Students need to remain Boston residents in order to remain in the Situate Medco program. And we had had a couple of people mm. move out of Boston. So that that's an automatic. Um, Got it. Yeah. But yes, there are some people who are choosing other things like like the exam schools in Boston. So once they get to the high school or to middle school, they'll choose to go to those Boston schools. Well, it, it's not a choice, really. It's like I take the exam, I pass. It's closer to home. I might as yep. well. Um, Got it. OK. All right. No, it's interesting. Again, I didn't realize that students, many of our students started the early elementary years. I just in, incorrectly assumed that it was more middle school, but interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you for presenting that tonight, Ms. Crawford. We appreciate the, uh, the information and, you know, obviously you're welcome at any meeting that we have. Thank you. Uh, so moving on in the agenda, we have the leadership report. And first up is uh, Superintendent Burkhead. Thank you, Chairman Long, and good evening, everyone. Um, just wanted to follow up and thank um, the Wampaduck uh, contingency of Ms. Reardon and um, the great work there. That was exciting to see how fun reading can be. I uh, also want to uh, thank uh, Celia and John for their updates, uh, student updates, and of course, um, Ms. Crawford with that uh, very important information on our MECO, MECO program. Um, and also thank her, the part that I think that slipped through there that was, you know, in our talks about equity, uh, one simple thing um, is a late bus for students that live in Boston. We have a lot of after school activities. We've started our uh, acceleration programming and she's worked real hard to um, get that. And it hasn't, been, it hasn't been there in the past. So to have that as, as a starting point is terrific. Uh, we're also looking, and I know shes it's tough to get, especially with bus driver shortages and things like that, also looking to get more transportation so that our students living in Boston can also um, have access after school for, to participate in all the things we offer. So thank you for that. And, and I did also want to comment on the um, some of the goals of Ms. Crawford overlap with the district. I know it was a question, um, and they overlap with um, uh, Dr. McGuire's goals at the high school. Um, and they tie in, if you recall, to my recent um, presentation on academic excellence and some of the accountability that we'll be measuring ourselves with our graduation rates, which will include, include students that living in Boston and, and, and all students. So we'll be looking to get those numbers up to 100%, certainly. Um, and one other goal is the um, accountability goal is for students taking in the high school advanced courses. And I know Dr. McGuire has a goal this year for that. Uh, into next year. So I wanted to just give her an opportunity to, to speak to that so that folks know that um, we are tying our, our, you know, our definition of academic excellence with um, concrete goals at the building level. So Dr. McGuire, McGuire did you want to just comment on those two things? Thank you. Yes, I would like to make one brief correct correction too. I do think it's more than two students taking advanced courses. I just did a quick check because I could think of students that I knew were in some classes and from our MECO program, we have students taking AP Lang, AP Psych, AP Calculus, Honors uh, Anatomy and Physiology, AP Literature of Sport, AP Graphic Novels, 
honors investing, um, AP Lit. So there are students taking some great courses. I looked at uh, six just quickly and all six of them are in an honors or AP course. Uh, what I don't think is happening is I don't think our numbers reflect the demographic representation makeup of our student body. And that is something that we're looking to correct this year and moving forward. Uh, I'm having conversations and department chairs are having conversations with teachers about uh, the course selection process, recommending courses for students uh, who are performing well and maybe um, may not see that, that opportunity in themselves. And that's something that we have to encourage and bring out. Uh, and teachers are really open to that process. We also want to get rid of the gatekeeping measures in our hand in our program of studies. So we want students to be able to take the chance if they're interested and invested in a subject and that we don't say you must have a 90 percent or better, for example, uh, in your previous course in order to be able to enroll. So we want to remove those barriers and offer supports in for students, which we're doing through the Mass Insight Grant. Students now have opportunities to do review sessions after school and on Saturdays, full practice tests. And those are measures that we're training and working with our teachers to be able to um, adopt and, and be able to carry out after the grant ends right on campus with our students. So we really have some great measures there. We're looking to increase our enrollment of and passing uh, advanced courses and advanced AP uh, exams uh, by 10% for the next school year. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, I want to just highlight some few cool things happening in the month of Thanksgiving, which is uh, a month to give thanks. So I want to celebrate some things happening in the district, if I could. First of all, uh, since our last meeting, obviously, uh, we uh, Veterans Day passed. And I just wanted to say thank you to all of the veterans that serve our district, that work in our district, uh, for your service to um, our country, but also to our school district. Thank you very much. And those who have served our great country val valiantly throughout the years. Um, our veterans have sacrificed so that we may live free. And I think the best way to pay respect for those heroes should be every day, not just one day a year. And one simple thing to do and something I'm trying to model is um, civility among fellow Americans. And I think one of our goals this year is to talk about communication and improving that. And for example, a phone call is better than an email because you lose context, you lose tone. Um, and meeting in person is better than a phone call sometimes. So all of our leadership are working on that. I know that's also something that the teachers are working on, reaching out to parents and families. And I think we're, we're getting a lot of good positive feedback from that. And personally, I think it's really allowed me to build connections with our parents, community and staff and students as well. So next thing I wanted to talk about is uh, something that had taken a temporary hiatus for the last few years um, is our fourth and fifth grade turkey trot. And some say it may have been better than ever this year. The, it's an inter-school community building fun run. And it took place under the lights uh, last week at Hadley's Flannery, Flannery Field. Uh, the races were fourth graders. They ran three laps and fifth graders ran four laps around the field. Race winners uh, for their heat earned a frozen turkey as their prize. So I thought that was pretty cool. And the participants showed their community support by contributing canned goods to the Situate Food Pantry. So a fun event, parents were involved, students and staff were involved, and it also benefited the community and taught our kids the importance of giving back. I wanna thank uh, the coordination from the elementary health and wellness faculty, Amy McDonald, Mark Puzangara, Rob Green, and Kevin Sawyer. And also a shout out to Kate Martin, who also filled in and did a great job. And for all the families that supported this, as well as um, our SPS health and wellness department chair, Greg Ranieri. So thank you all. Um, a lot of excitement and good to see that back um, as we move through the year. I know uh, Johnny had mentioned this in his report out, but I did want to highlight some of the um, end of year athletic um, events happening. Boys soccer made it to the second round and did lose to a tough uh, NASA team for nothing last week. Our cheerleading had an amazing season uh, ending in regionals last weekend. They hit another zero deduction routine. If you know what that is, it's pretty amazing. So that's awesome. Uh, they earned their highest score to date. So um, Reaching their uh, pinnacle at the end of the year is, is just what it's all about. So congrats there. 
and they held their own in the second largest division. So congrats girls for that. Uh, the cross country uh, girls team has qualified for all states, which is amazing, which is um, at the Rentham Development Center um, this Saturday. Good luck to them. And finally, our football team beat Ashland last Friday night at home and we'll play Grafton in the state semis at Brockton High School this Saturday at one o'clock. I want to congratulate Herb Devine on reaching his uh, 100th win milestone, which was pretty impressive. There was a, a pretty fun surprise celebration after that. Um, that. And so I want to thank everyone that was involved in celebrating that. Um, I also, uh, I know um, Mr. Payne has, a, you know, the winter coaches and parents meeting tonight. So I wanted to share this information. Uh, Coach Devine earned the prestigious New England Patriots Coach of the Week honors um, on behalf of the Kraft family and the New England Patriots Foundation. We want to congratulate um, Coach Devine and his victory last week and achieving his 100 wins. Uh, according to the Patriots um, news release, they want to honor Coach Devine as their 10th New England Patriot High School coach winner. They have only one a week, so it's pretty prestigious. They'll be visiting the high school tomorrow um, around noontime, and they wanna present uh, the football program with a thousand dollar donation uh, on behalf of the Kraft Family and Patriots Foundation in honor of Coach Devine. So, um, and also be, a, if you can't um, see that, which many of you won't, it'll be on Patriots All Access this week, which is on Friday night at seven. Um, and WBZ TV in Boston will have it available on their patriots.com, I'm sure. Dr. McGuire and, and Mr. Payne will get that information on as well. So a lot of great things happening there and, and uh, a fun time of year to, to really enjoy what the students are doing. And finally, I want to end with a, a sailor shout out to a student. Again, another emphasis this year is, um, is on student voice. And I thought this was a really good example, especially at a very young age. Um, and I want to give a shout out to uh, third grader Gates Esch. I thought I saw the family on the uh, call tonight, so hopefully Gates is watching. Um, he had reached out to me early in the year in, a, in, a, in an email, um, including Mr. Stevens, our food service director, to get rid of the styrofoam uh, plates in the cafeteria. Um, and I want to thank Mr. Stevens to make that happen and um, to show his class and character. Um, to make this happen. Uh, Gates has sent me an email and I just want to read that briefly. Uh, dear Mr. Burkhead, thanks to you and Mr. Stevens for finally changing the recyclable cardboard trays in the cafeteria. Yesterday, one of my teachers, Mrs. Broderick, told the whole class about my email and switched to cardboard trays. I got an applause from the whole class. Again, thank you for getting rid of poly polystyrene trays in our school. I really feel like this is a change that will make an impact on the environment and our health. Sincerely yours, Gates Esch. So Gates, thank you. Thank you for reaching out, for having student voice and know that we're listening. So that's my report tonight. Thank you all for listening. Great. Thank you, Superintendent Burkett. And, and thank you, Gates. I, you know, I mean, you just went off camera, but um, you know, it shows that any student at any, any age can uh, make a difference in our school. So thank you for, uh, for reaching out for what you believed in and making that happen. And Gates can speak if you so wish him to, Mr. Long. Uh, he can if he wants to. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for coming tonight. You're, you're welcome. So, hey, Gates, there, uh... I'm sorry, Mr. Long. I, I'm, I still want to meet you in person. Now I know. Now that I know what you look like, so get ready for that. You're famous. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted to be a celeb. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're on you're on TV right now. You you are the man. So thank you very much for 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 your hard work and efforts, my friend. Thank you. Are there any questions for Superintendent Burkhead on his report? All right, I do want to just echo what uh, Mr. Burkhead said about the the turkey trot. I was there last week. I didn't win a turkey, but. Um, it, it was great to see a lot of parents out there and, and a lot of kids out there, you know, taking part in that again um, after a couple after last year taking it off. And um, I think we have a good feeder program coming up to the elementary schools for our, our cross country and our, uh, our track teams in a couple of years. Uh, so next on the agenda is the assistant superintendent's report with uh, Ms. Triscoll. Hi. Um, 
Before I start, I, I want to thank um, Michelle Crawford and Lisa McGuire um, for making a nice segue. Um, we have talked about a couple weeks ago, Mass Insight, our partnership that's explicitly made to expand access to AP and make sure that we are making connections with every single student in that building. And it was so nice to hear that, um, that we're, I don't know, making explicit actions um, to talk about it and um, to work on all fronts. So thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Lisa. Um, and tonight I wanted to share with all of you another um, partnership that we've made. And um, this was recommended to us um, from uh, the staff at Gates. We are now a part of uh, Mass Partnerships for Youth. And this is a group that provides all sorts of opportunities for webinars and for in-person trainings for both our students and for our staff, mostly for our staff. Um, the unique partnership with, with this is they encourage um, school systems to work with local firefighters and police to train together um, so that really whatever you do um, for your community is truly through the community. Um, so the first training that we're doing in person with Mass Partnerships for Youth is going to take place on our half day in December, and it's going to be on the topic of navigating the cyber world. And in the morning, there will be student assemblies um, for middle school students, and it will focus on... Uh, it will focus on, I, I swear every time I present, that's when I'm waving to people. I, I, it's, I shall, I'll have him come over next time. Um, it's going to focus on students um, having the tools necessary to protect their digital footprint and even defining what that is. And sometimes um, when we have outside agencies and give examples, it, students hear things a little bit differently. Um, and then to follow that up, there will be a training for the staff and that'll be actually for middle school and for high school staff about navigating the cyber world so they can understand what the popular apps are right now. Um, the issues of cyber bullying and what are some of the possible consequences and struggles that we face right now and what can we do to prevent it. Um, so that, uh, that is through our Mass Partnership for Youth um, new connection, uh, which we're really looking forward to. Uh, so if anybody has any questions, I, I'd love to field those right now. Are there any questions for uh, Ms. Driscoll? Okay. No well, questions. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah, it's just a, that's a great connection. I think that's timely and uh, really useful and helpful for staff and students. That's great that you got that going so quickly. And we definitely agree with you, Nicole. Uh, so moving along in the agenda under new business, we have an update on the October 1st enrollments with uh, Superintendent Burkett. Thank you, Chairman Long. Uh, share my screen to put up um, each year we uh, send our enrollments to the state and obviously they're, the, they're numbers we look at and break down over the course of time. So I'll show you this year's uh, numbers. What I wanted to include this year is something new um, is the uh, class sizes down on the elementaries. Um, a part of our, our commitment, I know that when I started this job, that was an important focus to keep our class sizes at the elementaries, especially um, relatively sm small, which, in, in which I think we're doing here. Our um, class sizes, you can see if you're going over here, is fluctuating from anywhere from 16 to 20 averaging around 18 across the district, some 22s here, uh, again, smaller bubbles, but look, the outlook looks good uh, for years to come with the elementary school. Our overall enrollment um, has dropped a little at the high school with 866 and with total enrollment, 2793. Um, and that number is uh, dipped 60 students overall from last year. Uh, in reviewing these numbers with uh, Steve DePross, we looked at students coming in versus students coming out. And over the course of the next few years, um, that senior class was extremely large and was a bubble. There were 254 students that graduated last year. So that kind of talks a little bit about how we lost the, the 60 total versus those coming in. 
um, something that's not on here that we, uh, after looking into the weeds, um, that's we're continuing to look at is the homeschool numbers. And during COVID, there were 26 students last year. Um, and this year we're down to five. So certainly that was something we wanted to keep an eye on that um, that was a huge number. Uh, the years before there were three, four and two, I believe. And so getting it back, that number down to um, a reasonable number after COVID is, is a good sign for us. Uh, an area of concern that we're looking at, and this has been since 2018, is the number of students attending private school. Um, this year we'd start, like to start something new and looking at um, um, exit interviews on why. Uh, sometimes it's, um, you know, because um, students' parents went there, sisters or brothers or whatnot, uh, but other times it's not. We wanna find the reason for that. So since last year, we have 15 more students attending private schools. And again, we'll be digging into that data um, and finding out the whys of that this year through a, a process of uh, having exit interviews to get some more information on that. So those, those are some examples of looking inside the data. I, I know as part of our, our new school project that we'll have an extremely thorough deep dive into our 10 year numbers. We've already started that, I think with the um, feasibility study. So next year will be even more accurate than this year's numbers. But so I, I, again, in summary, I think that our, our numbers have dipped over the last you know, six or seven years by over a hundred, but I think they're leveling off and over the next three to five years look pretty steady around these numbers, um, 2,800 or so, 26 to 2,800 over the course of the next three to five years. And then when the feasibility study comes out, we'll have more um, specific data as they look into uh, people moving into the uh, town, buildings that are built, birth rates, um, and all kinds of very specific uh, analysis that will help us uh, determine you know, a lot of things in the district. But So it's looking pretty solid from, the, uh, from last year. And again, encouraging numbers with the school, um, homeschooling numbers going down, but private school numbers up, something we want to look at, two things we've identified as um, outliers right now that we want to pay attention to. So I'll take any questions anybody may have. Hey, Bill, I have a couple of, just a couple of questions. Um, well, actually a comment. I love the idea of the exit interview um, to find out, you know, what we could do or, you know, I imagine, you know, like you said, it's a lot, some, some of the kids going to private schools could be that, um, what are the, the legacy, <laughs> the legacy transfers. Um, and regarding the homeschool numbers, um, I'm just curious as to what the, if you know, know what the numbers were before COVID and, and compared to what they are now. You say homeschool, school homeschool. numbers? Yeah. I was just yeah, curious yeah. if, um, we had any homeschool kids before COVID. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Limblom. It's a great question. Yeah, I do have those numbers. In 2018, there were two. In 2019, there were four. 2020, last year, there were 26, and this year, there were five. Wow. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I just, I just have a, a comment, I guess, and um, I know Superintendent Perkins, you mentioned that last year's grade. This, this is enrollment for this current year, correct? As of October 1st, correct. Okay, yeah, so we lost some students. It was a, large, a fairly large class. So I think that this year is the largest, right? So 268. Correct. So then, so we're... I'm unable to hear you, uh, Mr. Gates. Peter, you cut out. Oh, sorry, this Chromebook. Um, sorry, the 12, 12th grade this year is 268. Um, and then next year is eighth graders of 192. We assume we lose a couple. So we're gonna lose like 75 to 80 students in the high school next year, correct? Roughly? That's correct. That's correct. And the same thing happened last year with the 60. Our freshman class was smaller than that. So this two year, there's a two year bubble, pretty significant, the 254 and then this larger number 268. And then as you can see, it gets kind of relatively um, similar without many bubbles coming up. Yeah. Yeah, it's concerning. It, it, 
I, I'm all for trying to figure out why families and students go or choose other, other schools. I think obviously some has to do with, as you guys have already stated, athletics and legacies and so on and so forth. I'd like to know what the real reasons are. Um, there's really nothing we can do. It, it is surprising. I would have anticipated that we saw some increase in enrollment in the younger grades, but we really have not. Uh, I guess maybe just the third grade is slightly, but it's still smaller than the current 12th grade. So, yeah, I mean, this is the data. This is it. This is what we have, right? It's just interesting to look at. It, it is. And, then, and I think with data, like we talked about, the same things happening here that's happening when we look at it. There's a lot more questions come up than answers. And then, you know, we have to kind of keep an eye on things and, and, and ask those why questions too. And if there's a concern, sometimes there is. And if there is, we fix it. And so, you know, um, Slim Blum brought up the, the legacy. You know, I, I think it, it, it's important to know why why parents and families are choosing private schools. If we want to be the best district in the world, we'd like every kid to come to Situate High School and we'd like to match what those private schools are offering. So I think that's exciting to me to find out the whys about that. And there's some things you, you know, you, you, you can't combat and some things you can. Um, I was a BC high freshman back in the day and I transitioned to public schools and it was the best thing I ever did. So I could be a spokesperson for those conversations, but I think uh, you know, that's a parent's choice. And again, my parents made that choice for me freshman year. And as a sophomore, I was able to make my own decision. So, you know, I think it is a, a unique thing, and, and but it's also a good conversation to have with families on if there is something that we could have done differently uh, or not, and we can get that as a question, but also if those things um, you, you don't know until you ask people. So I think that's a, an important first step. Right. I also think what's interesting is I, I think that most of us probably anticipated that kindergarten was going to spike up this year, but it didn't really. At 203, we, we just with the pandemic and some students maybe delaying entrance into kindergarten, but it looks like, no, it's still around 200. It's all interesting stuff. Yeah, and you. that, yeah you're welcome. That number's tough because some, some stayed out of kindergarten and went to right to first grade and, and, and some you know, are, are still in kindergarten depending on their age. So I think that number is, you're right. It's a, it's a little bit of a surprise, but I, I can see where it may be spread out a little bit between kindergarten and first grade. Any other questions for uh, Superintendent Burkhead? All right, so thank you for providing that detail. Thank you. Uh, so next on the agenda, we have an update from the policy subcommittee. So last week, uh, Ms. Limbaugh and Ms. Fiscal and I met at the high school and we discussed the, um, the update to the masking policy. And uh, Ms. Fiscal is going to present the, uh, the proposed change. Thank you, Chairman Long. Um, so uh, before I share the actual um, language of the policy, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that um, Ms. Lindblom and Chairman Long definitely heard the committee and heard the community um, share their feelings about the need for there to be some flexibility within buildings. So that came through loud and clear during that subcommittee meeting. And I think that the language that was put together um, reflects um, a commitment to have that flexibility. Um, so let me share my screen. Oh, wrong screen. Okay, do you see the policy? Yes. Yes, can you zoom in a little bit though? Say that again? Can you zoom in a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the biggest change is um, there is now, um, this up does not eliminate a policy for when face coverings are in place. So if face coverings are mandated for whatever the reason is at a particular building, the policy and guidelines that students and staff and people need, that people need to follow would still be in place. But the biggest change here is that um, 
in order to maintain a safe environment and keep classrooms open, the superintendent would have the flexibility to adapt the masking requirement at the building level. So right now in its existence, this is a district face covering policy. So this language now says, look, um, by the building level, considering information from multiple sources, including the Medical Advisory Committee, the Situate Board of Health, the CDC, the American Academy of Pediatrics, Mass Department of Ed, and the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, the superintendent could conclude that masking rules can change and he could implement changes after advising the chair of the committee and notifying the full committee. Now, this does not mean um, that we can go against any mandates from the state, um, just to be clear about that, but this does give the option. Uh, we heard about the 80% um, at our last meeting when we heard that information about the new guidelines. Uh, this would give the option for the superintendent to be able to put in that attestation school by school as necessary to give that flexibility. Um, and as you see in the green, um, the third paragraph, the remainder of the policy would stay in place when face coverings are required. So I don't know if Chairman Long, you wanna explain um, the procedure um, or if you wanna have a discussion. Um, I think we should have a discussion about it. Uh, uh, Mike, I think my just question is to Superintendent Verkin. Um, are you comfortable in having that authority? Um, yes, absolutely. And I, th I think the, the best analogy I can bring forth is, is last year. Um, and, and to put things into some context with this, I was, I was um, you know, thinking about last year and, you know, how many times we had to come back and forth with policies and the hybrid versus the remote learning. Remember we had the three different modems um, and sometimes you have to move fluidly um, to make decisions. And I think what happened was I was given that authority with, I think I believe it says in here consultation, you know, in informing the school committee, obviously, and all the other medical associations, DESI, our own medical advisory committee, which um, I make all these medical decisions through anyways. So it wouldn't be, uh, me alone. I just want everyone to be clear on that. Um, making these decisions, it would be through all those processes, which we've done before, continue to do. And again, the best analogy could be last year, having the authority with the same kind of direction and guidance from our medical experts from moving from hybrid to fully remote. If you recall, we had to make that call last year at the high school for two weeks. It was the right call. Our numbers were spreading in school. Um, we did it um, rather quickly and uh, smoothly without having to have multiple meetings and votes and things like that. So um, I, the, long, the long answer is, is yes, but I wanted to also give some context. I also did wanna share as attestation is mentioned in here. That is where uh, it is the first step in, in uh, any policy, uh, the 80% policy, allowing the superintendents and school committees to make that call. We have applied, uh, we should be hearing back any day uh, there is a process where the state, after you apply, gets a hold of me, asks a handful of questions about our process and how we're going to handle it, and what school and all that kind of stuff. So that call has happened. And according to the gentleman I spoke with at DESE, that we should be finding out very shortly on that. So once we have that information, I can share that. Uh, once that approval comes through, um, we're able to make a decision on the 80% rule. So that should be coming um, any day now, in fact. Good, thank you. So, so Peter, basically, I think basically what it, I guess Mike, sorry to interrupt, but basically what it's doing is we only meet twice a month. So rather than having to wait for the next meeting or to file a special meeting, Superintendent Burkhead can can make the decision as to whether or not this policy is enforced. Yeah, and, and Janice brought up a really good example when we met last week. I mean, it, it's kind of like a snow day we don't meet to make a decision on whether we're gonna have a snow date or not, the superintendent has full ability to go through and make that decision. And like you said, it's not in a vacuum. It's not based on, you know, a phone call he got, it's based on the information he's getting from the Mac, from 
multiple different sources to make that that ultimate decision. I think it's I think it's great. Thank you. I agree. I think it just streamlines the process. I love the flexibility. I think it's definitely an improvement on things to have it um, done this way for sure. I, I wonder if it would help even, um, sorry, Janice, like families and um, just thinking about emails that we get. And um, I don't know if maybe it would help communication wise, like for people to have it be clear that for us, things get choppy. And like you were saying that, you know, our meetings are every other, every two weeks, we have open meeting laws and, and things like that. I think um, it might help streamline things for families. So it's smoother and, and can even happen quicker and get in place better. So I think this is definitely good. I, yeah, Sorry, I think, uh, no, no, that's okay. Um, yeah, I mean, like when we were discussing this, you know, it just kept, you know, running through my head, like, oh, this is what happens on a snow day. You know, mm. Bill, Bill talks to all the key people in town to make sure it's safe for kids to go to school or if it's, if they need to stay home. And the one thing that we want to happen is to have, to keep kids in school and keep them safe. And, you know, I mean, honestly, the, the fact that the, you know, we have that one class at the high school that isn't quite 80%. I mean, that's, that's kind of nerve wracking as, you know, somebody who has to make decisions for that could affect the health of, you know, all the students at the high school, you know, this is, it's, this isn't an easy decision. And, um, so we put it on a bill. <laughs> um, no, I mean, on, in all seriousness, you know, it, we really just want kids to stay in school, be safe, and, you know, get their education. Um, and realistically, and we hope that, you know, what once we get that we hear from Desi on our at attestation, and, you know, we make masks optional hopefully we don't you know fingers crossed we don't see a spike in cases i mean you know we've seen spikes we, we're already seeing a spike in cases in the town and in the schools. so it's you know there's that mm -hmm. yeah just to clarify if if the attestation comes through we would not be masks optional for everyone um right, it right. would be it just for everybody to hear, it would be masks optional um, for those who are vaccinated. Yeah. I guess I have another question. So in subsequent to the policy, have there been discussions about, I guess maybe I'm jumping way too far ahead. I'm thinking about like Superintendent Burkhead makes the call once everything goes through and there's mask optional, I guess this is a secondary conversation about um, will will the team then decide also what thresholds we would or they would feel uncomfortable with being unmasked and that they would have face coverings required again. I just at the high school. I'm sorry, I, I think you, you broke up a little bit for me. I couldn't hear the end of, of your question. I actually had a question similar to Nicole, so I'll, I, I think I'll ask the same thing. Uh, to Superintendent Burkett, I know you and I had a conversation offline about it last week, but you know, we, we've talked in the past, but what's the threshold of you know cases? Is it, are we gonna go with a metric like two and a half percent? Are we gonna do something that's more you know, specialized to what is the, the actual number of cases in the school where, you know, where are they, is it all one class? Is it all, you know, one family and how, what, what kind of process would be done in order to make a decision on, you know, we're math optional right now, but we're going to turn around and be math required for X amount of time to, um, you know, to get through whatever spike in cases we're seeing. Yeah. So it's a great question, Chairman Long. I, I want to reiterate what, um, Ms. Lind Lindblom said, because the whole goal here is to remain in school full-time five days a week, right? So we have to protect at all costs because that's been working. 
and um, and we need our kids in school. So we don't want to get to a point now where we have to shut down schools or remove to remote or hybrid. So that's extremely important for everyone to know that that's our, our goal. Um, the 80% rule, should it go that way, would uh, be basically on a metric that um, some of which we took from last year from the medical advisory committee has come up with. Um, and it's not concrete numbers because it just doesn't work that way. There's not just a simple number that you can say, if we hit nine cases at the high school, for example, because three or four could be in the same family and not really impact the school. So if we went by that number solely, you'd be shutting a school down that wouldn't necessarily, or returning to masks, I should say in this case, when you wouldn't necessarily have to do so. So what the committee came up to with uh, the MAC, uh, and what I would look at are three things. We would look at the town positivity rate, um, just as a guide to see, okay, is it going over 3%? And, uh, and, and that's concerning. But more specifically, we'd learn at, look at positive cases uh, in the town. Again, in school would be more important to us. The example that I gave last time we spoke about this is the town cases in the positivity rate much might be much higher than the school because let's say, for example, kids come home from college. So their numbers are going up. Everybody's indoors now, numbers are going up. But at the school level, it may not. So that would be impactful more on, on our decision. And the final one, though, I think the most important one is in school transmission. And uh, to date, I think over the last two years, we've had one or two cases where we've been able to prove that it was spread in school. Now, if that were to be the case and spread would start happening in school and those numbers, and again, these are trends we're looking for, those trends along with the other two are showing a, a, a positive advancing number, then that would be the time to make the call to uh, put masks back on. So I want folks to know too, it wouldn't be okay, Monday we're in mass, Wednesday we're not in mass, Tuesday, you know, Thursday we're back up. It would be a, you know, a, a decision over time that we'd have to make and give people notice. Unless there was an emergency spread where, where like a snow day, we'd have to make the call that, that day. So where people have been wearing masks, um, you know, I don't think it'd be too difficult and people do need to understand that if we do go to the 80% uh, rule, those that are uh, vaccinated would have an option to, to go maskless. Those that are unvaccinated would still be required to wear masks. Uh, as of now, there's only two schools that I know of that have made this move. I think it was Hopkinton and Norwell. I've spoken at length with both superintendents. Um, and, uh, you know, for example, in Hopkinton, there's a, they're a smaller district. They have a 95% um, vaccination rate. We have almost an 83% and counting. Um, and, that superintendent told me that 50% of the students and staff still wear masks, uh, vaccinated ones. So even with the option, some people have chosen to wear masks. You always have that option. So that's kind of decision-making process. And neither one of those schools have a metric. So I, I think that, you know, that's also something to consider where every town, every school, every district's different. You know, we'd be able to walk the halls, work with Dr. McGuire and her team, see what's happening in the school, get a good pulse for that. And that's kind of the intangible that can't be put in numbers that we would have to look at. We did the same thing last year when we had to make the move from uh, hybrid to remote where there was some um, transmission happening at a, at a high rate. It was happening over the weekend. And we made the decision um, based on that, uh, again, which, can, which contained the spread and it was the wise move. But if we went simply by black and white numbers, we wouldn't have caught it. So I think there has to be that flexibility within our medical team and our administrators in school to look at. And just to be clear, based on, you know, Ms. Lombone's comment and something you just said, there is no hybrid option, correct? It is, our only option is in school five days a week. So obviously we wanna keep our staff and our students as safe as, as we can as part of this rollout. That's correct. And that's, that's part of the DESI declaration too. There's um, everybody's in school learning. Uh, some of the questions that I had, I know, you know, we've gotten a lot of emails from um, families who want us to go mask optional. Um, I know there's been a little bit of feedback as well from, from families that, you know, have concerns. So my question is, 
do you have a general sense of how this rollout would occur and some of the concerns that families have raised about going mask off so that we just need to make sure we consider as part of that rollout to make sure that you know we're keeping all staff and students safe so i'm, I'm sorry i missed the question so I guess my question is, are there, you know, as as we move to a mask optional school, are, are there, what are some of the concerns that, you know, we've heard from families that we want to make sure that we have addressed just so that all of our students are, and staff are safe? Are you asking me that question or the committee? Uh, well, it's starting with you, but I, I could oh. open up to the committee as well if they have any comments. Uh, well, I think the, the role of it, it role of it is as we just explained tonight that we have, you know, that we've reached the 80%. I think some people are frustrated that we've reached the 80%. And that's what Desi and their medical experts have, have given us as a as guidance. And um, so people are feeling that, that since we've reached that, it's now um, we should be able to move to mask optional uh, for those that are vaccinated um, because they've done what the state and what we've all asked to get vaccinated. I think, you know, so there's there's some of that on the other side of it. There's concerns of um, folks that may have be immunocompromised at home or have siblings that are uh, immunocompromised and shared that, you know, what protections they may have. And again, we go back to the vaccine and I'm not saying a vaccine's a, a cure-all, it's, it's something um, that, I think we medical experts have shown to um, protect people from getting hospitalized or, or really sick, not all, but many. So I, I think those are some of the, in, the, in the practical implications of it. You know, my personal concern is that, um, you know, a lot of it will be based on the honor system. And if you're not vaccinated, uh, you know, we don't want our teachers checking on kids to see if they're vaccinated or not. That's exactly not what we'll be doing. So that's a concern I think the staff, you know, had that we want to make sure that that's not happening. We don't want to um, you know, get into those types of things. Um, those would be conversations if there was someone that was unvaccinated and um, you know how we monitor that would be conversations with those students and their families. So those are the types of you know practical implementation strategies that we're looking at. We've had several meetings and I know Dr. McGuire and her team are preparing. Um, should we move to this? Um, so those are some concerns on both ends of the spectrum that, I, that I've received about you know, whether we met unmasked or not. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, in, in athletics is one. Um, and I know the MIAA is working on some possible language. Um, right now, there's been a, at some advisory groups meeting to give them advice on um, whether it's the home team you follow their guidelines or you follow your own school guidelines. So I think we'll be getting more guidance from the um, MIAA soon. I said uh, one follow-up question, uh, Superintendent Birkin. Over, I think what, 20, 20 districts have submitted the attestation and only two are mask optional, correct? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. No, I'd just be curious. Obviously, I know that we all follow this stuff, but it would be curious as as weeks go by, how many actually are at the 80% and have the mask optional. So right now, it's only 10% of the districts who have the 80% are going mask optional. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any question, other questions for uh, either Superintendent Burkhead or uh, Janice Heidi and I in the policy? Uh, Superintendent Burkhead, oh, I was just going to ask one more. Sorry, Mike. Um, yep. I was just curious, and maybe this is premature, as you know, given what uh, Mr. Long said earlier about you know wanting to keep our students and staff safe. Um, and also being flexible, because I know that we are reaching the point where it might be possible to remove masks. Has there been, what's the thought process on the monitoring, right? So if heaven forbid, we see an uptick in cases, like what's your thought of, sort of thought process to, to mitigate and make sure that we do remain in school, right? Because the hybrid is not the option. So I'm just wondering what the thought process are, is around that piece of it. 
Yeah, great question, Dr. Kowski. Thank you. And something we've talked at length about, and I, I think we and we talked about this at, at my presentation on this. You know, we found that distancing and masking works. It's those mitigation strategies do work. Uh, it's proven in our school data, anyways. You know, so I can stand by that. So I think what we would do is we'd have to return to putting masks on and then maybe looking at distancing. Um, as two mitigation strategies that we have at our fingertips. And so if we saw those numbers starting to get, you know, too high or, or dangerously unsafe where we'd have to return to, uh, um, excuse me, or threaten going to a hybrid type of a model, that would be our next step is to say, okay, you know, and that's why the flexibility in this policy would be, okay, starting Monday where, you know, we've got, and, and I think, you know, my thought process along with Mac would be that communication is everything to our families that, this is the reason if this does happen, if we do choose to go with the mask optional 80% uh, uh, DESI guidance, then people would know if we move back, uh, why? You know, we've reached, you know, 15 cases of in-school spread. You know, we're gonna do this for a week and see how it goes. We'll watch the numbers if they trend down. Um, so I think communication with the, with the parents, and that's a simple measure to put masks back on. And if we have to, you know, look at some distancing things at lunch and otherwise, if we get to that, kind of situation, we also have that flexibility as well. Okay. Uh, any other questions for, for on this topic? Mike, just for you, so this is technically our first reading on this policy, so our next meeting we would potentially vote or vote on this, and then that would give Superintendent Perkins the authority to implement the mass policy. Yeah, or, I was about to right. get into that. So, so right okay. now, the sub the subcommittee is not does not schedule to meet again. Um, so I would say if there's any questions from the committee on the wording that's in the policy, to reach out to to Janice Heidi and I raise the concerns. As you send them to me, so that we don't violate open meeting law, I can you know work with Janice and Heidi to set up a follow up meeting if we need to to look at the wording if there are any concerns from uh, members of the committee. And then yes, we would vote it. And then, you know, it would give Superintendent Burkhead uh, the authority to, to go mask optional when, um, you know, once we have that attestation back and then once we, um, you know, are comfortable in the schools and being able to do that. Okay, thanks. And uh, when is our next meeting? Do you have a uh, December 6th. Okay, thank you. We meet on the 6th and then we meet on the 20th. I mean, typically from a policy perspective, we're, we voted in our second reading. Um, but if there's either a lot of questions coming back or, you know, feedback from the MAC or, you know, from Desi that we need to make sure we consider, then obviously we would have to meet again as a subcommittee and get those, make sure any updates are um, reflected in, reflective in the policy. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so if there are no other questions or comments, this is the first uh, and only opportunity for public comment from the uh, participants on the Zoom call. Um, when I ask you to unmute, if you can just state your name and either address or um, school affiliation, and I'll try to get people in the order that they raise their hands, but if not, I apologize. Uh, so the first person is Jennifer O'Neill. Thank you, Chairman Long. Um, Jennifer O'Neill, Gannett Road. So my question, um, I was actually going to ask this this evening, but then I heard Superintendent Burkhead mention in some of his comments that um, he's all about communication and that an email or phone call is better than an email and an in-person meeting is better than a phone call. So my question is, when will this committee be back meeting in person? We have been 20 months since the last school in-person school committee meeting. Other committees in the town are meeting in person. Other school committees across the, the state are meeting in person. Why is this committee not meeting in person and when will they meet in person? Thank you. Uh, so I can answer part of that. So I've had a couple of conversations with Seth um, Pfeiffer regarding the technology to be used as part of the um, in-person in meetings so we can still have the Zoom. It's something that we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from on the town. And obviously we don't wanna to go to especially some of the important topics that we're talking about, such as the mass policy. I mean, curriculum is a big item week in and week out. We're about to get into the budget season. Um, and because we've had that large number of participants, both on Facebook Live and in, in the Zoom meeting, it's 
it's actually worked well across the um, the town, but we are looking to go back into a public meeting shortly once all of the technology is up and we're able to do so. Um, okay, I'm going to stop you right there. You have said shortly. To... You have said that every single time this question comes up, you keep saying shortly. We're going to go into it shortly. I'm meeting with Seth. I'm talking to Seth. Seth has done this with all of the other committees in town. I'm looking here right now, and there's 48 participants on this on this Facebook piece of it. I'm not sure how many. I'm sorry, on the Zoom piece of it, I'm not sure how many are on the Facebook Live, but most of the participants right now on the Zoom piece of it are the school committee, their teachers, their staff, their people that have been made co-hosts of this, and I don't know how many are just watching it, um, you know, to possibly ask a question, but those people could certainly, if the question is very important to them or a topic is very important to them, they can come to a meeting in person. We need to get back to meeting in person because we wait two hours, sometimes three, for one public comment section, and it's just, it's unacceptable. So I really think the school committee needs to work harder to get back to in-person meeting. And if, we're, if the school committee wants to align with Superintendent Burkhead's goals, and he wants communication to be a number one priority in this district, then this committee needs to meet in person. This is ridiculous that we're still on a Zoom call 20 months into this. I saw people at the football game. I see people at the craft fair. There are people out and about in the community. We can certainly have a meeting at Situate High School in the library in person. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next person is um, M. Ramaphosa. Hi, this is Michelle Ramaposha. I'm at 121 Sedgwick. I have kids at Hatherley, Gates, and the high school. And um, I want to make sure I understand correctly uh, the plans right now re with regards to masks. Um, from what I understand, you're saying that uh, Sidra Public Schools have asked Desi um, for the option to go mask optional for all vaccinated students. And the district has also adjusted its policy to enable the superintendent to change masking policies by school in accordance with um, medical advisory committee advice. Um, and just before you answer that, I, I just want to say that as it is right now, uh, from what I understand from my students who are my kids who are uh, Gates and high school students, the masking policy um, doesn't seem to be enforced uh, at either of those schools. Um, there is, you know, very adequate enforcement of other types of dress code policies, uh, especially with regards to girls and um, inappropriate, quote unquote, um, clothing. But masks, you know, teachers seem to kind of have a hard time getting students to comply. And, um, you know, I just wanted to bring that to the attention of the committee, because I'm not sure if you're aware of that, that there are quite a few students who don't comply with the, with the mask uh, mandate. And I'm not um, hearing that there is any kind of consequence for that. And um, aside from that, the, the fact that we're, we're asking to go mask optional for all vaccinated students students is a completely um, unenforceable rule. So there's no way anyone is going to know if someone is vaccinated or not. And students, can't, teachers cannot possibly be held to enforce a rule that they're not gonna be able to memorize every student who's vaccinated and who isn't. So um, I, I'm not really understanding what the point is of asking to go mask optional. I'm assuming that you just mean like mask optional period, not just for vaccinated students, since there's no way to enforce that rule. Um, and then I also just want to raise the concern that, you know, we have, um, we have seen spikes in COVID around the world, and particularly in Europe, and we tend to follow Europe in terms of um, when they have a spike, we are about two weeks behind them and, and tend to sort of mimic the, the level of, uh, you know, num number of cases that we end up having. So, there seems to be, despite the fact that, you know, vaccinations, um, you know, are pretty strong in our area, 
that we're seeing breakthrough cases nonetheless. So, you know, given that we're entering flu season, given that we're, you know, this is a, an area uh, where it's very cold, people will be indoors and we're going to see a spike and um, COVID, it just seems like an odd time to decide that we were going to go at mask optional. So I would strongly urge us to take a slower approach to that and um, to ask the student that, you know, the, the high school and middle school to start enforcing the mask policies that are in place now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for raising those concerns. We can um, definitely take a look at that internally about the, um, the enforcement. Uh, next is uh, Kurt. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I'm glad that you're uh, moving to this mass optional scenario because like Superintendent Burke had said, our vaccination rate is high. It's climbing in town. And I don't think it should have ever been in Desi's hands. It should have been a much more regionalized decision based on vaccination and based on COVID cases. All in all, for the size of the town, we're doing really well with cases. Some people freak out on Facebook when there's a jump of 10 to 15, which is absolutely minute in essence. And the great thing about the vaccination is, like Superintendent Burke had said, the data's there. Most people don't get really sick, especially kids. They get a runny nose at most. I think if people are concerned, like the last resident, they can wear masks or they can decide to maybe uh, teach from home until they feel this virus burns out, which all viruses do in time. So I'm glad to hear that we're moving toward that. I, I think it's the correct thing to do to have it in control of each building. I want to echo something the first uh, public speaker said, Jennifer. It is true, Michael, I have in my notes, you said in August, Michael Long, that you're working with technology to get these meetings in person. I'd rather have you say in front of all these people, the truth. It doesn't take 90 to 120 days to set up technology to have the meeting both ways, especially, especially when meetings are going on on all other committees in town. I mean, just tell the truth. You don't want to get this in, in person. And I get it. I, I'd, rather, I'd rather hear it from inside your head and your heart. We're not working toward that because you would have had it done. So please don't come next meeting and say, I'm working on it. Please don't do that again. I, I'm begging you. I'm sure other people will too. And I can say on. I'm I also, say honestly, well, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a Q and A, so just let me speak. And, and when we get in person, we can have a Q and A. And it brings up another point. Public Mr. comment is not a Q and A. Mr. Mr. Burkhead, yeah, Mr. Burkhead said several times in my notes here in the last 45 minutes to an hour. I would love to find out. I would love to see what people say. I'd love to have some feedback. Here's my suggestion. Why don't every other month the school and Superintendent Burkhead have an open meeting Q&A in the brand new million dollar auditorium? Have parents come in. Let's have a Q&A. Let's do it instead of these Zoom and Facebook meetings. Let's have a Q&A face to face and let's talk about what we're concerned about because the reputation of school committee talking to everyone in the last five to seven years, which you've been a part of, has been to discount parents. And I'm glad you're listening more now with this setup. I'm glad you are. But your, the, your, your historic precedent has been bad. You, you, you've discounted people, much like the guy that got removed or, 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 or we, we've kind of got rid of him by, uh, by, by the social upheaval with uh, Mr. Hayes, he's gone because he discounted people. He did it to me. Why don't you think about that? Please, uh, Superintendent Burkett, think about a public Q&A in the auditorium. Let's not go the way of Loudoun County, Virginia. Let's talk, let's be open. Because I can tell you one other thing and I'll wrap up. You wanna know why 60 kids left for private schools? I know, because I talked to other parents who pulled their kids out. 
One of them was the lack of attention by the school committee the last three to five years of academics. You saw the ratings, they've gone down horribly. And I'm not blaming Superintendent Burkhead, he's only been here 18 to 20 months. But some of you folks should be accountable for that. That's why they left was politics and the lack of attention to academics. And I'm glad I'm starting to hear more academics, better courses, more higher AP courses, or a little more focus on that. That is something I'd I, I like to hear. So I thank you for that. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, next up is the Ash family. Yeah, hi, Tom Esch. Um, as you've heard earlier tonight, we have a third grader at Cushing. Um, Mr. Burkhead, thanks very much for, um, for engaging with Gates. It means a lot to him. Um, a couple of thoughts. First of all, I wanna say with respect to Zoom and accessibility to this meeting, I think it's categorically unacceptable not to have Zoom available. Um, I understand that, that some folks may be frustrated with respect to the timing of technology being ironed out. Uh, but I just want to say, uh, as parents of a young child, um, not, you know, grown kids or kids who are out of high school, um, it, it's, it's essential to us to be able to participate in this. And we're grateful for that opportunity. And we support the school committee and the superintendent with respect to figuring that out knowing that others, as I said, may find that frustrating. Another thought, um, I just, I want to say it was terrific to hear from uh, Michelle Crawford about METCO tonight and where things stand, especially with respect to advanced placement and honors course enrollment. Uh, as a former admission officer at two highly selective institutions, uh, I can speak from direct experience, albeit a little bit dated, that this sort of thing is, is essential um, to hear more about as we think about opportunity for achievement with Medco students, but of course, more broadly, opportunity for achievement with, with kids across the board in Sichuan public schools, especially in the high school. Um, that said, I think that, you know, excellence can only be achieved when excellence is available to everybody. And so, I, I applaud uh, Ms. Crawford's efforts to ensure that accessibility and, uh, and, and thank her for all of her work. That's all, thanks. All right. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Jennifer DeSabatino. Good evening, thank you. Um, I, I had a couple of comments. Um, one, and I'm going to keep it to the three minutes, I promise. Um, one is I wanted to thank um, Michelle Crawford for her efforts to get children into um, METGO and into the Situate schools as early as possible. As someone who had to um, switch high schools from one coast to another in the middle of high school, um, it was extremely difficult. And so I, I know from personal experience that, that it's, it's, a, it's a hard move to make. And I didn't have um, a lot of the things in my backpack, so to speak, that the kids um, who are coming from Boston do. And um, I, so I'm really happy to hear that that's an emphasis. Um, with regards to the masking and the public meeting issue, for one, I find it bizarre that people are upset about the Zoom meetings when the two people who are most violently opposed to this just had unfettered ranting access for three minutes. Whereas if you were in a public meeting, as we've seen across the country, they've gotten ugly, they're yeah. loud, bad, and we, we don't want that. We want a civil discourse. And I think that the best way for that to happen right now, especially with the temperatures of so many people being so heated is to keep it civil and make sure that people say their piece and move on. And it's not a back and forth. It's not a Q and A um, that really is not um, productive. Lastly, with respect to the masks um, and also the comment about students leaving, I, I, I'm sure um, 
Mr. Gunther knows people who left for some reasons. I'm a parent whose child is currently technically homeschooled um, for none of those reasons. And so I think it's presumptuous for you to present as if it were data information um, that is representative of all of the parents who have to make decisions that are in the best interest of their children. Um, and one of the things, you know, whether I bring my son back into the school system is going to significantly depend on what this mask decision is. And as a teacher, <laughs> this, the, the mask optional prep plan, as I'm hearing it, is, it, 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 it's, it's not a plan. It, it's not a plan for, you, you can't enforce it. You can't chase down kids. Even if you did it and you have not identified any way in which you would identify who is and who is not vaccinated. So it's honor system. And the people who don't feel like getting vaccinated statistically are very many the people who hate the masks. So I, I, I don't think it's, a reasonable solution. And I, I want to be without masks. I have to teach every day with a mask on. I have to enforce that rule. I can't even tell you how many times a day with my students. It's annoying and I want it gone. But I also want everybody healthy and safe. And I'm, you know, have had to drag my son in to get the COVID test way too many times because he had a sniffle or some diagnosis or another and he can't go back to his program until he's had a test. And it's, it's frustrating the number of people who cavalierly and with absolute scientific illiteracy are stating that it's not significant for children. We don't know the long-term effects. So please don't state that because it's not a fact. Secondly, I think it was two weeks ago, we had more people die on that day this year than we had died the previous year before the vaccines. People are being cavalier, they're being frustrated and I get the frustration, but you have got to be careful and scientific about your decisions. And not just because somebody is angry and screams loudly at a public meeting. We've got to make the best decisions, not the decisions that are catering to the basest, most craven, elements of our society. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, next up is Lori Withrow. Hi, Laurie Withrow, 62 and Vinyl Road. Thank you. A few comments. First of all, I love the MECO program. So I loved listening to Michelle Crawford tonight. We were able to um, host a student back when our 20 year old was at elementary school. And I wish there was one in our grade now in elementary school, which we have not, my son has not been able to experience that. So I do think it's a wonderful program. So I'm sad that there aren't more applicants and that they're trying to find um, students to attend. But I just wanted to echo that I think that's a wonderful program that we have here, especially in a town where we don't have that as much diversity. So just wanted to applaud that program here. I think some of the things that we've talked about tonight sort of revolve around each other. Um, we talked about the private schools and um, some, of some of the students that have gone off to private schools and we talked about academic excellence um, in other meetings as well as inclusivity um, and I do think looking at the data of why those children have left situate schools to go to private schools is, is definitely something that needs to be looked at. I've seen it, I've seen families leave, I've seen on social media, I've seen in meetings, I've seen people speak out when, even times when I've spoken up at meetings and I've seen comments after, well, just send your kid to private school if you're not happy here. And that's not the answer. And I think that is something that we have to look at, you know, that people are not, people don't act inclusive. We say it, we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, but having to really listen to parents, listen to families, that's important. So all of that goes around with each other. 
of you know listening and finding out what's going on and not just dismissing what people have to say. So I appreciate you know that Mr. Burkhead did talk about you know that private school data and that we do need to look and see and not just dismiss it of why our students are leaving or families are not comfortable sending their children here. So I appreciate that. Um, I do want to echo what, um, as well, what um, Jen O'Neill and Kurt Gunther said. I do think that it's time that these meetings do go back into person. Every other meeting in town is in person. There was hundreds, maybe thousand. I don't know what the number was at the craft fair on Saturday going through the high school, but it is possible. We need to be in person. It would be good. It's good to pe see people, not to be all of us sitting in a room by ourselves. We need that again. We need to get into a room with each other and have that communication happen. And then finally, I wanted to just touch on, it, it didn't come up as much tonight, but the meeting two weeks ago, I was actually very upset about the talk about the vaccine and the pressure put on um, the families on the vaccine, as I feel like that is a decision that should be between families and their pediatricians and not, not from school committee members or administration. But you know, I, my son had his physical last week and that's a discussion that happened between the pediatrician and us on what the best course is for our 10 year old. So I, some of the things that I've heard in the past week, I jotted down a few things. I've heard a teacher ask their students if they're being vaccinated, other children asking other children if they're being vaccinated. One, one child was told, I won't be able to play with you if you're not vaccinated. I mean, we talk about, we talk about inclusion, but this whole piece of the vaccination, we also have to talk about the inclusion piece. Um, my son came home on that Monday, the day of his physical, and ended up and told our pediatrician, four kids in my class are being vaccinated today. And my pediatri our pediatrician said, Jack, how do you know that? So pediatrician, Jack, how do you know that? These are not things that should be talked about in the schoolyard about vaccinations. At the turkey trot on Wednesday, the whole group of children standing in front of me, the children were talking to each other, you being vaccinated? I mean, these are private health decisions for families and pediatricians. And, um, and that's all I wanted to say, but thank you for listening. And um, hopefully we'll, we'll all get through this, but I just wanted to um, make a few of those comments. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you for those comments, Laura. Uh, and next is, um, the name is Hillary's iPad. If you don't mind just stating your name, either address or school affiliation. Hi, it's uh, Hillary Tyson. Um, I'm at 10 Wamsuda, and I have a student at Jenkins in third grade. And I really only have two quick comments. Um, one is to thank you um, and the school committee for continuing to hold these meetings in, via Zoom. Um, it makes the meetings accessible to everyone. And, you know, from my perspective, I work at a company with 40,000 employees. If we didn't have Zoom, we wouldn't be able to have meetings. We couldn't be flying all over the country and all over the globe. And meetings are effective in the real world uh, via Zoom. So I just want to thank you. Um, I understand that there is a passion for in-person meetings, but that makes it very difficult for everybody to go. Um, and then the second comment is, it would be great um, if uh, you as the moderator could try to get the public comment section to be each person less than three minutes. I know you have a really tough job, but a lot of people, you know, want their voices to be heard, but we're all on this um, call and, you know, we have to listen to some ramblings sometimes. So that's all. Thank you very much for all of your efforts and for listening. And I believe our policy actually says people have up to five minutes. I'd, I'd have to double check, but so far no one's oh. been over that, but, but thank you for your comments. <laughs> well, good to know. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Kristen Scott. Hi there, Kristen Scott, uh, 93 Lawson Terrace. 
Uh, I want to take a moment to thank Assistant Superintendent Heidi Driscoll for her efforts. It is so refreshing to see positive action toward academic excellence. The initiative she has taken, the partnerships that she has, you know, already created in short time is hugely impressive and it offers, you know, parents like myself and my husband encouragement. Um, I have really high hopes for her stamina. I'm also encouraged about the conversation regarding masks being optional. It's long overdue and it is the right thing for children. I would like to echo the thoughts of a couple of other residents who spoke tonight. I do agree and would ask that in-person school committee meeting options, at least, you know, the option for, you know, a hybrid Zoom slash in-person, um, that option becoming available, I think is really important and uh, can and should be developed quickly. Uh, the exit interview for students leaving for private school, I think, could be a really helpful way to gather information. We are admittedly a family who are who is likely leaving Citroen Public Schools, um, and I would love to, the opportunity to share with the powers that be why we're considering leaving for private school. And more importantly, you know, gathering that information is one thing, and then reacting and modifying things in Citroen is even more important. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and next is Alexa Houghton. Hi, thanks so much. Um, I really only wanted to come on tonight. Oh, sorry, Alexa Houghton, 28 Hatchet Rock Road. I have a student in the high school and one at Hatherley. Um, and I just wanted to come on as I was listening to some of the rantings earlier and let you know how unbelievably grateful I am for the Zoom meetings. I absolutely would never be able to attend otherwise. If we can come up with some sort of a hybrid version of this, fantastic. But personally, I am very, very grateful. And um, just as I was listening, I kind of wanted to um, touch on uh, what Lori said earlier, wondering why so many children were asking other children why they were vaccinated and why other children are talking about it. Um, they're talking about it because they're concerned for their own personal health. It is a public health issue. Um, just my own personal opinion, but I just wanted to get that out there. So thank you very much. Um, that's it. Thank you. Um, and next is Milena Davidova. Yeah, hi, this is Milena Davidova. I have a uh, Gates kid and a high school kid. Um, I just have a couple of points. Um, so I believe that uh, public health isn't a private decision. Um, it is a, especially during a worldwide pandemic. So we're not in a bubble. And um, thank you for continuing the meetings virtually. It has made all the difference as we can see by the number of participants each time you have a meeting online versus when it was in person. Um, also, I believe the honor system that was mentioned for uh, the possibility of going mask optional will not work because it's just not going to be possible to enforce that. And um, finally, my concern is about the mask optional move by building uh, where families have siblings in multiple schools in our district. So how do you control that? Anyway, that's my input. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. And as we do go to mass optional, that's all things we, I know we've had some conversations, or I've had some conversations with the superintendent behind the scenes, but making sure that that's part of the, the rollout and keeping us, um, all, all students and staff safe. Um, and one other person, uh, Mary Beth, I apologize for if I get your last name wrong, uh, Sabeti. Are you there? Hi, um, thank you for having me. Um, Mary Beth Sabeti, 46 Indian Wind Drive. Um, I've never spoken at a meeting before, so I apologize. I don't look meeting ready. Um, I just wanted to add, I um, wanted to touch upon a couple of things just to add some minor 
insight possibly. I have two children. My seventh grader does go to private school. Um, he left at the end of last year. I have a freshman at the high school. Um, I think as parents, we all know that our kids are very different and need different things. For me personally, the family decision that we came to was that the academics were not strong enough for my son to continue at Situate Public. Um, and that, that was a family choice, but for me, it was not a legacy decision. It was not a sporting decision. It was the academic rigor. And for us, he could benefit more um, elsewhere. So I just wanted to speak from that point of view because I do have two children in two different systems currently. Um, as well, uh, my son does go to BC High and they right now are mask optional. So I feel I can speak on some level to that. They are grades seven through 12. Um, they have a very high vaccination rate of students and 100% of faculty. And all those kids are vaccine eligible, obviously. Um, if you choose to wear a, a mask, you obviously can. Um, it's respected, it's regarded. You, you do what works for you and your family. Um, and it is not on the honor system. If you are vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask, but it is well known who is and who is not vaccinated within the professional community of the school. Um, and my son does not wear a mask at, at school. He does take the commuter role where he has to wear it. Um, if there's masks or a large assembly, then they do wear it. And if there are teachers that also feel like they would like the mask worn in that specific classroom, then they can have that um, mandated in their room. It hasn't been an issue. It hasn't been a problem. Um, and there is a plan in place. November 8th, they started um, without masks or mask optional if you're vaccinated. And to be clear, it's 1,442 boys and 96% are vaccinated. Um, and they will put masks back on the week after Thanksgiving and proceed into the Christmas break and keep re-evaluating. They also follow DESE and the Department of Public Health, and they had their own um, leadership team and internal and external medical committee meetings. Um, so there is that piece. So I do experience that. These boys come from 80 different towns, and they do not come from just the state of Massachusetts. And they're from very diverse families. And um, this is where that specific school is at. And it's a very large student body with a very large faculty. So I feel like I can speak to that somewhat. Um, and we feel confident in the decisions that are being made at that school and that guidance. And I think anything can be done well if the plan is put in place and it is expressed to parents. Um, but currently we are comfortable with what is going on with that plan. Um, and I thank you for your time and I hope I can offer some um, insight and I would be glad to answer any questions further as to why I did pull one child and why I've kept um, another. So happy to do an exit interview or also um, discuss why I have one in the public school system and background. I did go to the old gates. I did go to Jenkins. I did go to Wampatuck. Um, so I've been a resident for most of my life. So I think I have a fairly good handle on the town. And I also did go to Notre Dame Academy for high school. So um, that's my background. Um, but if anybody on the committee or anybody ever needs to ask about why we left and why we kept one, I'm more than happy to answer it. And um, thank you for your time and thank you for all that you've all done. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. Thank you. So seeing no other hands raised, I'll move on in the agenda. Uh, the next item is the approval of minutes. So in our backup, we had the November 1st meeting minutes um, provided to us. So unless there are any questions, I will entertain a motion on the, uh, the minutes. All right, I'll make a motion to accept uh, the meeting minutes for November 1st, 2021. I'll second. Uh, so the roll call vote. Uh, Long, yes. Lindblom? Yes. Uh, Gates? Yes. Borkowski? Yes. And uh, Brandolini?
Thanks. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you all. Um, we do not have any correspondence in our backup. So the next item on our agenda is uh, an update on the warrants from Dr. Dutch. There is one warrant uh, this week. It's warrant S211104. Total amount of $140,563.76. Uh, one item out of a revolving account, out of a school lunch account, $78,873.50. Part of that was uh, food supplies and the balance was for a new dishwasher, uh, dishwashing conveyor belt uh, machine in the high school cafeteria. Out of our uh, local funds, there were three, large, three fairly large uh, purchases, expenditures. One was private school tuition, $7,700.50 to the Olive Aaron School. The other was for contracted services uh, under heating, $8,880 a repair to the Gates uh, expansion tank and the Situate High School heating coil. And then also under contracted services, other, uh, the camera work, camera system work at Situate uh, High School, at, at various schools, excuse me, for school safety in the amount of $12,809.01. Uh, those were the only large purchases in this warrant. Are there any questions for Dr. Dutch? Yeah, well, thank you for uh, presenting that, Dr. Dutch. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, is there any other business that members of the committee wanted to bring up in tonight's meeting? Yeah. Uh, so our next meeting is December 6th. Um, we'll have ce celebrate student learning with uh, Mr. Ranieri from the Health and Business Department uh, in overnight field trip uh, from DECA. And then Nicole asked that I put on um, an update on the charter review. So she'll present that. We'll have the math policy again. And then uh, capital planning had actually tried to schedule a meeting for tonight, but they couldn't because we couldn't have a quorum. And I was obviously going to be here. Um, so we are trying to um, re redo the date for that. Once we do, I'll give an update on the, the capital planning for, um, for next year. Are there any other agenda items that members of the committee wanted to make sure we address? Um, if not, I will entertain a motion to adjourn at 8.18. So moved. A second. Um, Long, yes. Uh, Borkowski? Yes. Eight. Yes. Limbaugh? Yes. And uh, Brandon. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Have a uh, great rest of your night. Thanks.